your Bible, please turn to John chapter 16 today, if you will. <clears throat> if you remember, if you were here last week, heard the message, we looked at the second half of John 15. The first half, of course, is that life in the vine, the true vine. The second half is the reality of what that life entails. You live it in a hostile world in a hostile environment. And so we saw what Jesus warned his disciples about in verses 18 to 27. But remember, he, he, uh, he promised them several things, and that promise continues. And I believe that chapter 16 really is a continuation. He's preparing them for his soon departure. And then things are going to get hot after he leaves them. And he says in the first verse, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended, that you should not stumble. It's easy to stumble when things are opposing us. You know what? Really, the biggest hindrance to the ministry of the gospel is not the opposition that we as God's people face, but our fear of opposition. The belief that your personal safety or your family's personal safety and the absence of risk is of great importance is really the opposition that we face as believers. Safety can't be our primary concern. Fear is really devastating. It cripples, it paralyzes. It causes believers, instead of going as the Great Commission commands us, it causes us to run and hide. And fear will devour all joy. It's a deadly enemy in a believer's life. It's been said that your fear is the greatest tool that you give Satan. And overcoming your fear is your greatest tool against Satan. Going is difficult. Staying is hard. But sending and blessing our children is the hardest because Americans and even believers in this country idolize our children. And I think most parents would be willing to die on a thousand crosses than to keep their child from dying on one. That's why Jesus says in such clear terms in passages like Matthew 10, 37, if any man loves father or mother, son or daughter more than me, he's not worthy of me. Or in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, if you do not hate father, mother, son or daughter, you can't be my disciple. If you don't hate your own life also, you can't be my disciple. You have to take up your cross in order to follow me. Pretty harsh words, but the reality is we live in a hostile world. It's a hostile environment. If we are going to spread the gospel, if we are going to live up to that great commission, it's going to require us overcoming the fear. And so I believe that chapter 16 tells us how we live in a hostile world. And there are several things that he brings to our attention. The first four verses, for example, simply again reiterates the fact that in this hostile world, as a believer, you have to be ready to suffer. That's what the first four verses are about. And by the way, in order to be ready to suffer in as a believer in this environment, you have to make that decision before the situation arises. It's something that has to be settled, you might say, in the past. That has to be settled before you go forth to the gospel, that you are ready to suffer. We'll look at that in a moment. I think we should pause a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, just so thankful for the scripture you leave us with such clear direction. We're not just left here to just kind of grope 
through the darkness and find our own way. You're so clear. And I pray that just the thoughts that we have from the scripture came from your lips in an upper room, such holy ground, that upper room. Lord, speak it to our hearts today. Give us what you want us to get from it. This is your time. This is, we want your will. We want Jesus to be heard and to be honored. So Lord, give us receptive hearts. Do what you alone can do and need to do in each one of us. Yes, Lord. May that be our response in Jesus' name. Amen. Ready to suffer. I want you to note uh, how he prepares them. He gives them notification. Uh, he said, look, I'm telling you what I'm about to tell you, what I'm about to continue to share with you, so that you don't get offended when persecution comes. That's what verse 1 is all about. And the first part of verse 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues. You're going to be kicked out of your own congregations that you, your family grew up in. Down in the fourth verse, he tells them, these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But of course, the time is coming when I'm going to quit. I'm going to depart. And you're going to be without me. And so I'm preparing you for that. And part of that preparation, you got to be ready to suffer. He gives them notification in those verses so that they have a heads up. So they're not caught off guard. And they're not tempted to quit and give up when the heat is turned up. When the persecution comes. Be ready to suffer. And then he talks about uh, really the perpetrators, the persecutors. In the second part of verse 2, verse 3, he says that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. What a miscalculation that really is at the base of this suffering that he's preparing them for. And the miscalculation is that uh, the people that are perpetrating it, that are going to kick them out of the synagogue, that are going to try to kill them, thinking that they're doing God a, a favor, doing service to God, is simply because the ones behind it have refused to believe in Jesus. They have refused to receive God's Son. It's the same thing today. It was that way then. They're hugely mistaken because they did not properly ID the Lord Jesus. And so they refused to believe him. They didn't believe that he was the son of God. So be ready to suffer. And then in verse 5 and on down through verse 15, here's the second thing. How do we live in a hostile world? Not only be ready to suffer, but these verses tell us rely on the spirit. Rely on the Spirit. And that's something that you do now. That's something that you do continually. Here's what he says in verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, verse 7, I tell you the truth. It's expedient. It's to your advantage for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that is that special name for the Holy Spirit of God, the Comforter, the Parakletos, the one who is called alongside, the special supernatural helper in the believer's life, the Comforter, if I don't go away, he won't come. But if I depart, I'll send him unto you. And when he is come, he's going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. How do you live in a hostile world as a believer that you're supposed to spread the gospel to? Well, you have to be ready to suffer, but you must, in doing so, rely on the Spirit. Because the Spirit is the replacer. By that I mean the Spirit of God replaces the Son of God. 
on this earth. He's the replacer. He's Jesus' substitute. And Jesus says here in this in these verses that you know what? This substitute that I'm sending is really going to make you better off than me being here with you as I have been these three and a half years. You're going to be better off than having my physical presence. You know, sometimes we modern believers, oh, if only, you know, Jesus would have walked the earth in our lifetime. If only he would be. We're better off with Jesus in heaven making intercession for us and having the spirit of God right here living in us and always with us. He's better in many ways because, as I've said, you're going to suffer. But guess what? I'm always with you. How is Jesus always with you? Through his spirit. So through his spirit, he's always with us. Through his spirit, we're empowered to live the Christian life and to be his witnesses. We have direct access, access rather, to this to the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. Direct access. And as we'll see in this chapter, we also have answered prayer through the Spirit who prays in us and abundant in an eternal lasting joy. So we're better off with this replacer. That is the Holy Spirit of God. But in verses 8 to 11, he's not only the replacer of Jesus, but he's the reprover of the world. See that? He's the reprover. When he comes, he will reprove the world. And the word reprove means to bring something to light, to expose something, to shine a light on it and, and to expose it. He is the reprover of the world. He will convict the world. The Holy Spirit has been sent to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. He is going to convict the very ones that persecute you. He's going to reprove them. He's going to shine the light on them. But how does he do that? The Holy Spirit of God could be likened to a prosecutor in a court of law. And the witnesses are the believers. And the guilty ones, of course, is here the world. And so he will bring to light. He will convince lost people in this world. First of all, he says of sin. And then he explains what he means by that in verse 9, of sin because they believe not on me. Now, when we think of sin, we think of acts of sin. But do you know you can clean up your act and still end up in a devil's hell? You know, you can live a good life and you can do your best and yet you can quit sinning even and yet not be saved. What you need is Jesus as your substitute. What you need is the forgiveness that comes through Jesus alone. And so the Holy Spirit of God, he convicts the world of their sin of unbelief, of their Christ rejection, of the fact that there is no hope and there is no life and there is no salvation apart from receiving Jesus. It's an unbelief in him that condemns. And then he says also to convict the world of righteousness, verse 10, because I go to my father and you see me no more. To convict the world of the fact that their personal righteousness is as filthy rags, is totally insufficient. He convicts the world as the world observes in Jesus' dedicated, obedient followers, that they lack the righteousness that God himself alone can provide. I should say this, the way that uh, the Spirit of God convicts the world, reproves the world, convinces the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment is not because he's just floating in air somewhere, but because he is indwelling the bodies of his people. 
And it is the spirit of God in believers that is the way in which he convicts the world in these areas. It's through your lives as a believer that the world is convinced of sin, of unbelief in Jesus, that they are convinced of their lack of that righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus. And he says also he will convict the world of judgment, verse 11, because the prince of this world is judged. Through us, the Holy Spirit will bring to the realization of lost people that they have missed Jesus' sacrifice, and so they can't, they can't be saved unless they receive him. They've missed his righteousness, and they're depending upon their own self-righteousness, and as a result, they're judged. They're under condemnation, just as, he says, the prince of this world, who we know as Satan, is judged. Now, his judgment at that point had not actually taken place. His judgment took place on the cross, but as far as Jesus was concerned, it was already done. And this is what the lives of believers are meant to do. Our lives are meant to be convincement of the world in those three areas. That's how the Spirit reproves the world. That's He's the reprover of the world. But also, in verses 12 through 15, he's the revealer of truth. He says to them, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. I felt that way in teaching people. There's things that I would like to say. There's things that I would like to uh, instruct, and yet they're not ready. And Jesus says uh, in the 13th verse, how be it? When he, when the spirit of truth has come, he'll do it. He'll guide you into all truth. He'll not speak of himself, literally from himself. What Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He'll show you things to come. He'll glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. The Holy Spirit of God. When we live in a hostile world, <clears throat> we not only must be ready to suffer, but we must be ready to rely on the Spirit of God, who here is the revealer. Here's the mark of a great teacher, really. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, look at their method. They're careful to give the right amount of truth at the best time. Verse 12, when people need it and when people are receptive. You know, one of the things that I have always appreciated and I have tried to incorporate in my own ministry is the way that God takes people where they are and very gently and patiently seeks to bring them along to where they should be. And that's what I get from that uh, 12th verse. And the Holy Spirit of God is very instrumental in this method to bring people along. And then look at the message in the 13th verse that you see here. It reminds me of what was said in chapter 14 and verse 26. If you remember there, it says, when the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Here we have, I think, the way that the New Testament that you have in your hand today was actually written. Jesus tells us how it was written in this 13th verse. When you compare 1426 with, with 1613, that's how our New Testament was written. It's amazing. The Holy Spirit reminds what Jesus taught. He reminds these disciples what Jesus taught. And as a result, you know what we have? We have the four Gospels. That's what he's talking about here. And then he says uh, that he will guide us into all truth. As far as I know, what that's talking about is the fact that uh, all of the epistles is the remainder of what he has taught. All truth is really caught up in the New Testament epistles or letters. 
And then he says in that 13th verse, and he will show you things to come. That's prophetic truth. That must be reference to the book of Revelation in particular. So the whole New Testament is really contained in 1426 and 1613. That's how we got our Bible. That's how the Lord gave it. He reminds them what Jesus taught them, the Gospels. He guides into all truth, the epistles. And then he shows things to come, the book of Revelation. What's the meaning of it all, though? Well, verses 13 to 15, we've read already, basically is this. It's all about Jesus. And it's all from Jesus, who he got, which he got from his heavenly father. It's the triune God really working in harmony together to reveal all biblical truth to us. We don't study the Bible to win arguments. We don't study the Bible in order to show off our, our biblical knowledge. But we study the Bible to see Jesus. We study the Bible to know him, to grow in him, to reflect him, to share Jesus in a hostile world. Relying on the Holy Spirit. And then there's a third and a final thing in this 16th chapter that I wanted you to see. How then do we live in a world that's against us, in a hostile environment? Well, you got to be ready to suffer. You have to rely on the Spirit. But the rest of the chapter, 16 to 33, really can be summed up in this. You rejoice in sorrow. Look at what he says. He already said, your heart's filled with sorrow. Remember that? Verse 6. Because I said these things, your heart has been filled with sorrow. Jesus says in verse 16, a little while, you'll not see me. Again, a little while, you'll see me because I, I'll go to my father. And then they didn't understand. And he knows what they're thinking, what they're talking about. And he says to them in verse 19, you inquire about what I said a little while, you'll see me. And then again, a little while, you'll, uh, you won't see me. And then you will see me. He said, let me tell you. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, you'll weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. You're going to be sorrowful because you're going to know what happened to me. You're going to see what happens to me. And then I'm going to depart this world. The world's going to be happy. They're going to be rejoicing. You're going to be sorrowful. But, verse 20, your sorrow will be turned to joy. And he used this illustration, verse 21. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, but as soon as she delivers the child, the sorrow goes and it turns to joy because of the newborn babe. Verse 22, and you now therefore have sorrow, but I'll see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. In fact, in that day, you're going to ask me nothing. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Up to this point, you've asked nothing in my name. But now you ask in my name, and you're going to receive, and your joy is going to be just running over. It's going to be cool. Rejoice in sorrow is how you live in a hostile world. And this is looking toward the future. And in that 21st verse, I see a very important principle that I wanted to share with you. Joy in the Christian life is not something that you substitute that to substitute sorrow with, but joy in the Christian life is not substitution, it's transformation. Here's what I mean by that. The same baby that brings pain to a mother brings joy to that mother. You see, God doesn't give us pain in order to simply relieve that pain, but rather, and, and, and thus substitute a joy for it. God gives us pain so that he can transform that pain into real joy. I think that's what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and beginning in the ninth verse, remember he had that thorn in the flesh, and he prayed, and finally God uh, told him, 
my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Weakness transformed to strength. The miracle of God's grace in our sorrow. He turns cursing into blessing. That's how God works. That's what our pain, that's what our sorrow is really about. God doesn't merely want to substitute it with joy. He wants to transform it. And that's the principle here. How we rejoice in sorrow. How do you rejoice when you're being persecuted? God transforms that pain into joy. And what wonderful promises we have in this passage regarding prayer. That uh, we have, no matter what, we have real lasting hope. Prayer that is made, he says, in my name. That is, for my sake, on my behalf, asking what Jesus wants. He says, not only that, but I will ask the Father on your behalf. I will intercede for you as well. You ask on my behalf, I'll ask on your behalf. And prayer will be answered. Prayer will be joined together and God will answer. It's the promise of God. Remember how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 1, I think it's verse 20. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. They're done. And so there's that promise. And then look at the last part of this verse or chapter. Verse 29, his disciples said to him, oh, now you speak plainly and you're not using proverbs or parables. Now we're sure that you know all things and you need not any man ask thee. But by this, we believe that you came from God. Jesus said, oh, you do? You now believe? Behold, the hour cometh. Yea, is now come, and you will be scattered, every man to his own. Verse 32, you'll leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone. My Father's with me. Verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you, that you might have peace. In a hostile world, Jesus gives us this so that we might have peace by being ready to suffer, by relying upon the Spirit of God, by letting him transform our sorrow into rejoicing. Knowing the things that Jesus shares in this chapter will bring peace to your heart. In fact, he concludes that chapter in the second sentence in verse 33, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We overcome because Christ overcame. We live in a hostile world, but he already overcame the world. He overcame the world. His crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, his enthronement is proof positive that he overcame the world. And we have in 1 John, I think it's uh, 5, 4, he says, we overcome the world by our faith. By our faith in what? Actually, by our faith in him who already overcame the world. And so as we depend upon him, as we trust him, as we depend upon the overcomer himself, we become overcomers. Facing opposition. Suffering persecution. We become overcomers. In the world, you shall have tribulation. Mark it down. Be ready to suffer. But be of good cheer, because it's not the end of the story. I've overcome the world. There's victory at the end, flight at the end of the tunnel, whatever you want. to. There is hope. And that's how you can rejoice in sorrow, because of the position that you have. It's a wonderful truth. 
I have overcome the world, therefore you can overcome the world. I have spoken these things unto you that you might have peace. You know, there's a lot of things that threaten to take our peace from us. There's a lot of situations that come up unexpectedly and all of a sudden our peace goes. But you remember what Jesus said in the 27th verse of chapter 14? Peace, this is your memory verse, right? Peace, I leave with you. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth. World peace is different from Jesus' peace. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, I claim that, and I think you do too at times. Because when my peace goes, I can say, God, I need your peace. I want to exchange my troubled, my worried, my concerned heart for your peace. And when I do that, his supernatural peace lifts my heart and I overcome through him. It's a wonderful truth. I want to close with a, a story that uh, comes out of uh, Russia prior to the falling of the Iron Curtain, as, it's, as it was called. It was during the days when believers had to meet secretly, and there was a, a particular pastor that was uh, arrested and imprisoned. His family was taken uh, miles and miles away from their home and placed in an uh, old rickety cabin in Siberia. And uh, one time this mother and her children were at the end of their supply of food. They had eaten their last uh, crusts of bread and their last cups of tea. And she, were, she was putting the children to bed that night. And they said, uh, Mama, why doesn't... Uh, why doesn't God uh, give us food? We're hungry. And does Papa even know where we're living now? And she assured her children that the Heavenly Father knows they're hungry and knows where they're living. And they got down on their knees. Children, they prayed. She put them to bed. And during the middle of the night, about 20 miles away, a deacon was awakened by the Lord. And the Lord woke up that deacon and said, gather up the vegetables that uh, the church has stored up and the meat and any supplies. Go out into the bitter winter night. Harness up your horse. Uh, hook up the sled. Put these provisions on the sled and take it to the uh, a pastor's house and the deacon argued with the Lord, but Lord, it's, it's winter. It's, it's zero degrees out. I, I and the horse could freeze to death going that distance. And plus there's wolves and we could be attacked. And he said that the Lord just spoke to his heart and he said, just go. But Lord, what if, what if I don't make it back? And the Lord spoke to his heart again and said, I just asked you to go. You don't, you don't have to come. You don't have to come back. And he obeyed the Lord. And uh, as you can imagine, in the middle of, of the night, the pre-dawn hours, he's knocking on the door of this rickety cabin. It must have scared the daylights out of the little family. But when they opened the door and they saw the deacon and all of the, the supplies that... Uh, he had been given to them. And he said, this is from the church. And uh, when you run out, please let us know and we'll bring more. And by the way, he made it home safe. Seemed like a senseless thing. And sometimes we're so full of ourselves. And we think we know so much more than God. And we think 
some of the things that he may ask us to do is foolish. I guess my question to you and to me is, will we follow Jesus even if it seems senseless to do so? In the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Father in heaven, just to ask that you might use the thoughts that we have uh, looked at this morning to really accomplish your will in us. We want to hear, Lord, that still small voice and respond positively to what it is that you're speaking to us as individuals about. Sometimes, Lord, we've been asked to do foolish things in the eyes of the world, but it's precisely what your will is for us, and there's great reward when we know that we've done the will of God. It's just, it's reward enough to have the joy of the Lord that results in obedience, that, that results from obedience. And Lord, we just pray that you'll do it. Whatever you want to do, through the word of God, we'd be ready to suffer. We'd rely upon the spirit. Lord, we we have our sorrow turned to joy. We rejoice in sorrow because we're overcomers through Christ who loved us. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. With your heads bowed, yet your eyes closed. I think that the Lord... Uh, perhaps is speaking to your heart this morning. Maybe there is someone here that the Lord has spoken to you about something and maybe you thought, wow, that, I, don't, I don't know if this is really from the Lord. And he is calling and he's speaking to you right now and he's saying, when are you going to fulfill what I've asked you to do? Will you follow the Lord when it seems senseless to do so? Will you do the will of God? that he's spoken to your heart about. Maybe there is someone that the Lord is speaking to go and to follow him, maybe even out of this country, somewhere else in this world. God has put his hand upon you. Are you willing to say yes to him? Perhaps you don't even know where it is at the moment. Maybe he's not been that specific yet. Something God has spoken to your heart about. Are you willing to say yes to him no matter what it is? If you, you're here this morning, you're a believer. And there is something specific that you believe God is speaking your heart about. Would you acknowledge that? Would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, just remember me in prayer. I know God's dealing with my heart. Amen. Couple? Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Something that God has spoken to you about that you have yet to obey or follow through. Would you do that? Would you? Say yes to him this morning. Anyone? Anyone else? Yes. Amen. Yeah. You know, if you haven't trusted the Lord as your Savior, none of this makes sense. And your need is that you come and you recognize again, you're convicted of sin because you've rejected Jesus. That's the great sin. You've rejected Jesus. Stop rejecting him. And receive him. He's waiting. And while he's waiting, his arms are open. Why don't you run to Jesus this morning if you've never trusted him as your savior? He's your only hope and salvation. Everyone here today that knows that you need to come to Jesus and you desire to receive him as your savior today, to run to Jesus. We, we sang about it. I run to Christ Run to him for salvation. Have you done that? Anyone? Need to do that today. Today's the day.